Hi everyone, welcome back. We're carrying on with homeostasis again today, looking at the control of water and kidney failure. So we're going to be covering how water levels are controlled in blood, kidney failure itself, and how something called dialysis works. So as always, grab some paper, grab some pens, and follow along with me. We're going to start off by looking at how water is controlled in our body. Now if we think back to the lesson where we looked at the brain, uh, you'll know that there are many regions. And the region that we're really interested in in this scenario is the hypothalamus, or rather the pituitary gland that lies within. So we're going to start off by just drawing ourselves a little picture of the brain and pick out your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland. Or if you know, not art inclined, you can always just write brain or pituitary gland. So we've got the cerebral cortex at the top, you've got your hypothalamus, which is about here, and then attached to your hypothalamus, you have the little bit called the pituitary gland. We're just going to label that. I'm just going to have to write hypothalamus, I've run out of space. Now, the hypothalamus is the one that actually detects the changes in the water content in your blood, but it's the pituitary gland that actually produces the hormones that controls the blood levels. So just make sure that you know that the hypothalamus is the one that monitors and the pituitary is the one that carries out the response. The other part of your body that's involved in water control is of course the kidney, which we've looked at before. So on the other side, I'm just gonna draw myself a picture of a kidney and then we're gonna talk about how the interactions between these two parts work. As we looked at before, inside the kidney you have these small things called tubules, which are surrounded by millions and millions of capillaries. So we're going to be drawing that as well because that is the part inside the kidney that we're interested in. We're going to start off by looking at what happens when the concentrations of salts in your blood is too high, or in other words, the water content in your uh, blood is too low. What happens is as the blood is flowing through your brain and goes through the hypothalamus, it's always detecting various things, and in this case, how concentrated the blood is. So once it detects that the blood is more concentrated than usual, the water level's too low, uh, it will then start to release a hormone from the pituitary gland. But before we get to that, we've got to think, what could cause our water levels to get too low? Could be a fact that it's hot, so you're sweating. It could be you're not drinking enough fluids, especially water. So those conditions would cause your blood uh, water levels to go down. So what's going to happen is the pituitary gland, or sorry, the hypothalamus is going to detect this and it's cause, going to cause the pituitary gland to release a hormone that's targeting the kidney and that hormone is called ADH. So the pituitary gland produces ADH, which targets the kidney. Now ADH, you need to know that it stands for anti-diuretic hormone. Way to remember ADH is diuretic. Uretic has the urine, the word urine in it. So anti-urine hormone or anti-weeing hormone. You don't want to wee because you want to retain that water because it's too low in your blood. So, pituitary gland, sorry, hypothalamus detects that the water in the blood is too low, so that blood is more concentrated. It makes the pituitary gland release ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which targets the kidney. And what happens then is in the kidney, you'll find that because the blood is low in water, there'll be far more water molecules inside the kidney tubules compared to the blood. So what will happen is via osmosis, a large amount or a large volume, sorry, of that water is going to move from the tubule into the blood. What will happen then is that will return the water levels to normal. 
On the other hand, what will happen is if the blood water levels are too high, so your blood is too dilute, the opposite will happen. So the hypothalamus is still gonna be involved, the pituitary gland is still involved, but rather than producing ADH this time, what happens is the, the pituitary gland will stop producing ADH or reduce the amount it produces. So you've stopped taking your anti-wee hormone, so there you're gonna wee more, you're gonna get rid of that excess water. So that goes to the kidney, and this causes, again, less water to move into the blood. So your kidneys will have less water in the tubule compared to the blood this time. That's what's get detected by the hypothalamus. And so therefore, only a small amount of water will be reabsorbed by osmosis. How oh, flipping heck have I just spelt reabsorbed, ladies and gentlemen? I'm sorry. Re absorbed. Re absorbed. Clearly, I've not improved my spelling technique over the Easter break. So, from the top, you have hypothalamus in the brain, in the pituitary gland. Hypothalamus detects the water level changes. The pituitary gland causes the response, releases the hormone. That hormone is ADH. If there is not enough water in the blood, ADH is produced, so more water is reabsorbed from the tubule into the blood, so therefore the, the blood gets more watery or goes back to the normal. If there is not enough, uh, or sorry, if there's too much water in the blood, this could be because you are not sweating, it's colder, or you're drinking a lot. That's going to stop the production of ADH, so less water is reabsorbed, so therefore the blood becomes less dilute. And the sort of balancing between there being too little and too much water is something that we call negative feedback. I always think of negative feedback like trying to balance on a tightrope walk or trying to keep something perfectly balanced. So the idea with negative feedback is if something changes in your body and conditions go down, your body responds by making the conditions go back up. And if the conditions go uh, too high, they're gonna respond by making the conditions go down. So it's always going between this flux of not enough and too little, but your body does its best to sort of keep those differences as small as possible. So think of it like tightrope walking or trying to spin a load of plates. That's control of water in the blood. So let's have a look at kidney failure. Kidney failure is something that is very, very serious. As we've seen, without our kidneys, we lose our ability to filter all the things out of our blood or put, or put back into our blood that we need. So things like glucose, we get rid of urea, a, a toxic waste product. We reabsorb ions that we need. We reabsorb, you know, things like water, etc. So if your kidneys fail, that can lead to death quite quickly. Remember, you do have two kidneys, well, two, two, two kidneys. Um, one on each side. You can live with only one, but if you lose function in both, then that is seriously bad news. So we're gonna look through mainly what happens or the, the treatments of kidney failure, not how kidneys fail so much. You can look that up in your own time. And we're gonna have a look, a look at dialysis. So let's start off with the fact that, as I said, you can have one kidney and survive. But if you lose the function in both, then that is bad news. So, the only real treatment for double kidney failure, or you know, both your kidneys don't work, is transplant. You can also have dialysis. That's usually a sort of stopgap between, you know, getting on the waiting list for a new kidney, or if someone can't or doesn't want surgery. So we're gonna look at both types, and then hopefully in an exam, you can sort of evaluate one versus the other. We're gonna start off by looking at transplants then. So when I said kidney transplant, that means they, somebody else's kidney is taken out of their body and put into the patient. It's transplanted, moved into someone else. So you'd have your patient who's not feeling too well. And the patient, unfortunately, you know, is, is, is on a waiting list. 
you can't just put any any person's kidney in you can't put animal kidneys in if you have a patient that needs a kidney you need to find someone that is a match so you'd usually go to family immediate family they are more likely to have a match but you can get donors that are complete strangers as long as they have a tissue match the thing that they usually look for is uh, to start with is matching blood types uh, our blood types and our tissue types are slightly different but they are close enough that if you have a matching blood type then it's a higher chance that you're going to have a matching tissue type as well so you'd get some people that are willing to give their organs to the patient you can't just you know say or oh, just come on into the room buck them on the head and then take the kidney out um, what will happen is if they don't match then they're out of the running if they do match um, blood types then they can then be tested and if their tissues match then they can give their kidney so that kidney's removed now this is a surgical procedure so there are risks involved as with any surgery kidney's removed and then it is put into the patient and then the patient hopefully will recover and lead a full and happy and long life afterwards so that's how it works we need to look at pros and cons so the pros of this is that it's really long lasting once you've had a kidney transplant as long as you treat it properly it can last you the rest of your life however it does have the drawbacks of of course you need to find a tissue match and anything that involves surgery does come with its own risks If you don't have a matching tissue type if you were to try and take someone's kidney that wasn't a match what will happen is the patient's body will reject the kidney it will treat it just as it would treat any foreign pathogen and it will attack it with the immune system <laughs> and that's all you need to know about transplants The other treatment, which as I said, is a bit more like a stopgap or a, a sort of a shorter term solution is something called dialysis. What happens in dialysis is you have your patient and what happens is their blood is rerouted out of their body via a, a large blood vessel and put into a machine called a dialysis machine. Okay, so we've got a patient, blood's going to be rooted out of the body and into the dialysis machine and then back into the body, but it's going to go through the machine first. So this is the dialysis machine. our patient and I'm going to use red to signify that blood is moving inside this dialysis machine you have a semi permeable membrane in the middle that is very very similar to you know semi permeable membranes being our capillaries and surrounding the semi purple membranes, you have a large amount of fluid. And then, you know, a reservoir here that can restock the fluid. What will happen is the dialysis machine basically acts as an artificial kidney. As the blood passes through, you'll have things like urea, you'll have your glucose in there, you'll have your water and your ions that we've looked at previously. And if you've forgotten about how the kidneys work in general, I would go back and watch the previous video, video on the kidney itself. Now the fluid inside the dialysis machine is very special. What this fluid is, is a mixture of 
you re um, sorry, it's a mixture of glucose, water, and ions that are the ideal concentration and the ideal conditions that mimic blood. Concentration of that fluid never changes. Well, until you introduce the blood anyway. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So, the dialysis fluid contains no urea at all because that is a waste product. So when the blood passes through the dialysis machine, all of that urea is going to diffuse into the fluid and be removed as it's moved, you know, the fluid's taken out of the tank and, and processed. The glucose, water and ions will all depend on the conditions of the person's body. So if they're, you know, if they are in need of a bit more blood glucose, glucose will move in or it could move out. It, again, it depends on the conditions of their body at the time. But because they have the dialysis fluid, which is the ideal conditions for human blood, the, the um, dialysis machine will always filter the blood in the correct way. So if they, you know, it's a bit low on ions, ions will be added in. If it's a bit high in glucose, glucose will be taken out. So the blood goes through, gets cleaned, for lack of a better word, uh, and then it goes back into the patient's body. Now this process has its pros and cons, and again, you'd probably have to be asked to evaluate them in an exam. So let's have a look. The good thing here is it is a lot safer than surgery. I mean, yes, you are having your blood rerouted through the machine like some sort of bionic person, but compared to actually removing and replacing organs in your body, it is a lot safer. You know, you're less likely to come into complications. On the other side, though, dialysis itself and dialysis equipment is incredibly expensive. You know, you're looking at thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, for the hospital or you know if you aren't living in somewhere with free healthcare, your cost. Uh, the other downside is that it's quite restrictive. So these dialysis machines are really big or they you know the older ones are quite big and you would have to go in for a full day a few times a week to undergo dialysis treatment. Uh, these days they do they have made them a bit smaller and you can do it overnight but you know you are still hooked up to a machine that is filtering your blood and you cannot move. So that is uh, kidney failure, transplant and dialysis. So make sure you've got notes on pros and cons of both. Uh, the fact that you need to know more about how dialysis works than transplants, to be honest. The thing with transplants is just knowing that you need a tissue match and you know any surgery is risky, but it's a long-term solution. And dialysis, it's you know really posh and cool, uh, but it's really expensive and it's restrictive. And that will do us for today. Uh, make sure you join us again soon and I will see you all very, very soon next time.